I thought I would relate to you a little bit today, and Eldon's suggestion, some of the things that we did as users uh, back in the old days, and uh, some of the problems we had, some of the challenges, and some of the fun that we had. I uh, got my start in, in this business here at MIT, as a matter of fact, or at MIT. I was uh, a young pilot in the Air Force and always wanted to be a test pilot. And they told me the best way to do that was to get a graduate degree. So I looked around and I'd heard about this school in Massachusetts and uh, applied for it and was fortunate enough to be selected and started my matriculation uh, under the uh, team guided by Doc Draver. And uh, I remember early on there was a lecture one night given by a fellow from Germany named Werner von Braun. And so a friend of mine and I went to listen to this, and he was talking about rocket ships. Now, I was, a, I was an airplane driver, and I remember when they announced the first uh, Mercury astronaut, so I thought, monkeys. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, I, we went to this lecture by Werner von Braun. He had these pictures of these big rocket ships, and he said, we're going to send men to the moon in these things. And I hit my buddy and said, <laughs> this guy's really wild. <laughs> and, uh, but by, by gosh, sooner or later, I realized that Werner's philosophy was correct, and by golly, we did all that. Matter of fact, he used to have another saying that he used, which I think is good philosophy and it applies to about everybody, especially up here. He used to say, if you want to be successful, you must early to bed, early to rise, work like hell, and advertise. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I, I enjoyed my days at MIT. I think hardest I ever had to work in my life, but it was interesting. And there's a, uh, a story. I live in California now. And uh, in California, they think Caltech is the place to be. And there's a story about two students talking about the contributions of the two schools to uh, exploration of space. And of course, at MIT and the lab and et cetera, uh, they designed and developed the Apollo computer, and the MIT student was saying, you know, we helped get to the moon and did all this work on the Apollo guidance and navigation system. And Caltech student says, uh, well, yeah, but we're going to do better out here in California. We're going to design a system to go to the sun. Of course, the MIT kid says, you can't do that. It's too hot. And a Caltech student not being outdone says, yes, we can. We're going to go at night. <laughs> and, but you, you can't put one over on an MIT student, I'll guarantee you. The MIT student looked him right in the eye and says, you can't do it in one night. <laughs> and, and it brings us to the question, now that we've been to the moon, which is more important, the sun or the moon? And we found out that indeed the moon is more important because at night, the moon shines and gives us a little light, whereas the sun only shines in the daytime and it's light anyway. <laughs> Got to think about that. And then there's a one about the new president who takes office and doesn't have much experience with space exploration. And uh, having realized that he has many, many problems uh, upon initially taking an office such as that, one day, the Secretary of State, who is also new, walks in and says, Mr. President, we have some dramatic news about space. The President says, oh, really? The Secretary says, yes, sir. He says, but some of it's good and some of it's bad. And the President says, oh, my goodness, well, why don't you give me the bad news first? I'm used to it. And the Secretary says, Mr. President, we just learned that the Chinese have landed on the moon. The President says, oh, my goodness, what can be good about that? The Secretary looks at him and says, all of them. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, well, one of the reasons we uh, were able to do all that is because we had a terrific computer. And after I left MIT, I went out to the, uh, the test pilot school and spent a couple years there uh, doing what I thought I really wanted to do until I realized that I got pretty interested while I was here in school in space as opposed to aeronautics. And uh, about 1963, NASA advertised the selection of 
the third group of astronauts, and I thought, well, I, I really did enjoy the inertial guidance and other, other things I learned at MIT, and I thought I'd give that a, a crack. And I was selected in October of 63, and I went to, uh, to NASA as a, a young uh, captain at the time, fresh out of test pilot school and fresh out of MIT, and uh, there were a total of 30 of us, and they looked around to see who could represent the astronaut office in various disciplines with some background. And of course, I was fortunate enough to have spent a couple years up here working with people who ultimately uh, built the Apollo guidance system. And uh, matter of fact, Dick Batten was my thesis advisor, and I think the first course I ever had that I even knew what inertial guidance was, Walt Wrigley taught, and uh, Doc Draper was running the instrumentation lab where I did my thesis. So when I was offered the opportunity to follow for the crews guidance and navigation, well, I, I really jumped at that. And I started coming back up here to monitor that for uh, NASA in Houston relative to the user. And being an astronaut, we helped in the design configuration uh, from the user's viewpoint. It was quite an educational process because you have to understand what goes on inside to be able to assist in the design outside. And I spent many nights up on a roof in Cambridge looking at the stars and working with a sextant and a telescope and, and the computer. And it, it all looks pretty simple and straightforward now. And as a matter of fact, as I reflect back uh, on the crudeness, really, in those early days and how little we really knew about what we wanted to do, uh, a lot of people knew, the people who invented it, but to try and configure that and make it as useful as, as it ultimately became, I think was a, a remarkable achievement. Uh, some of the things that we did in those early days, uh, as a matter of fact, when I first came up here, I remember the lab, uh, Jim Nevins was there at the time, and he had two pictures on the wall. And one picture had this Apollo spaceship in its sort of conical configuration, <laughs> And there were three guys inside lounging around, uh, having dinner or something, nothing else, totally clean on the inside, one button, two buttons. It said, go and come home. <laughs> and that was one side of the coin. The other side of the coin was, as you can picture, a little spacecraft full of computers and tapes and all those sorts of things, where it was totally complicated and nobody could really figure out what was going on. Fortunately, we got somewhere in between. Uh, also in those days, which this is about 64 and 65, there was a concept we called in-flight maintenance throughout the whole spacecraft. And uh, the idea was if something fails, while well, you place, replace it in flight. And I remember they'd established a course, a curriculum up here for six months to help teach people how to change components in flight. Well, we never did that because, gosh, it was tough enough to learn how to operate the first line systems, much less how to change them. But late in the program, I remember when, when other people joined the program, we did have some things left over from the early design in the, in the spacecraft itself, which reflected in-flight maintenance. And people used to say, gee, I wonder why that connector's there and that connector's there. Nobody uses it. Well, you we just never got around to a change order to take them out. But it was quite different from what we ultimately ended up with. Another interesting discussion was, what kind of clock do you have? Well. In those days, everybody had analog clocks, watches. Nobody really heard of a digital clock. And uh, a computer naturally expressed its time digitally. And there was quite a, a design, what should I say, uh, consideration, competition, discussion, whatever, on what kind of clocks to have. And I think the influence of the digital computer uh, ultimately showed the advantages, especially in our business of, of you know, traveling in space, if you will, the advantages of a digital clock. And the initial Apollo design, as a matter of fact, had three analog clocks on a panel and ultimately ended up with digital clocks. And as a matter of fact, the whole control center in Houston ended up with digital clocks, and everybody wears one on their watch now. So I thought it was a pretty interesting uh, evolution. We, we also had some, some challenges in terms of capability and capacity of the computer. And uh, this is really in the days before anybody flew one, how many words you could get into it and what was the configuration. You know, a core rope memory was something that precluded changes late or close to launch, late in its development time. Uh, 
And at first everybody said, oh my goodness, we won't be able to change the day before launch. But I remember in the end, everybody said, thank goodness we can't change anything the day before launch. <laughs> because, you know, every time you change one little routine, everything else had to be verified. And probably one of the best decisions, in my opinion, that was ever made was to freeze it early. So that uh, even we got into erasable later on. But that was a pretty good decision, and people had to settle down and decide what they wanted to do. We also had some interesting limitations. As I recall, we had in the beginning, I wish I'd heard Eldon's complete discussion because I might know more about what I'm talking about, but I'm digging back in my memory. As a matter of fact, it was sort of fun to sit down and think about this. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about the Apollo guidance computer for, gosh, six or seven years. And it was sort of fun going back and reflecting on some of the things that we got to do. But as I compare what's available today with what we had then, I, as I remember, we had 24,000 words and stretched it to 36,000 words, and that was just a major, major effort. And I got a little Apple II in my house, and I got 48,000, and it's easy. I mean, it costs hardly anything. If I want to get another card, I stick another card in it. Uh, it's incredible how far we've come. We also had this panel that we operated, the crew, and great debates occurred relative to what it should look like. And how do you talk to a computer? I mean, how, I mean everybody was writing. When I went to graduate school, why we had a, a language called Mac, which I guess was a predecessor to Fortran, and a lot of people did machine language. But how do you take a pilot and put him in a spaceship and have him talk to a computer? And that was, that's not easy in real time. And I think somebody, and I don't even remember who came up with a verb noun concept, but I'm surprised that's not utilized in other computers today because it was very simple for us to operate with a series of uh, two-digit numbers uh, representing verbs and another series of two-digit numbers representing nouns. And it's, it's so straightforward and simple that even pilots could learn how to use it. Uh, and we had some interesting words. Our initialization program was zero, 00. And we abbreviated the identification of programs, of course, with a P. If you wanted to do a, a major engine burn, you use P36 or P45 or some identifiable program with a combination of P and the number. If you ever had a problem, you went back to zero, 00, which we ultimately called poo. So if you ever had a problem, you went to poo and reinitialized. And uh, a lot of little words like that. We also had, you know, you developed the digital autopilot, which was the DAP. And uh, a lot of guys had trouble punching all these keys. I liked it. I thought it was sort of fun to get in there and see how fast you could go. Some guys could never really get a hold of this key punching bit, and they wanted to reduce the number of keystrokes to get information. And we, at one point, tried to design a sort of semi-automatic program or a, a minimum keystroke program. And that became known as Minky, minimum keys. And some people liked Minky, and some people didn't like Minky. Uh, it sort of limited your capability, but it was a lot easier to work. But anyway, as, as we went through the development or the end of the development process and got the computer actually into operation, uh, we had it in simulators and uh, quite a few places. And it was really, I think, from the computational capability, it was a joy to operate. I mean, that was just a tremendous machine, and you could do a lot with it. As a matter of fact, it was so reliable that we never had a backup, and we never had a failure. I think that's a remarkable achievement. Uh, we had some glitches here and there, but uh, to my knowledge, uh, at least in flight or with my the 10 years I spent with it, there was never uh, a real computer failure. We practiced a lot of computer failures, and the simulators simulated, simulated a lot of computer failures, but we, we never really saw one. We. Uh, as I went through my career, I spent a couple of years uh, up here in the early design development phases, and then I went off and flew Gemini 8 with Neil Armstrong, and we had an interesting computational exercise ourselves. I had to, another company had a computer on there. I don't remember its name, but it was, wasn't DEC, it was somebody. But uh, we had, for the first time, no reentry program on that particular Gemini flight, and you had to read a tape in to program it. Well, Neil and I had this little problem and had to come down early. And uh, in those days in Jiminy, there was great competition on 
who could land closest to the carrier with a computational capability on board. And they were getting down, you know, 12 miles, 9 miles, 6 miles, 3 miles. Boy, it was really great competition among the crews. Well, Neil and I still hold the record for landing furthest from the carrier. <laughs> we, we, only, we only missed it by 6,000 miles. <laughs> Some people say it was the tape. Some people say it were the parameters we loaded in it. Actually, there were some other problems. Another, another capability that we had uh, in the Apollo computer, and, and now I sort of move past Jiminy into uh, my second flight, which was Apollo 9, and that's where we really got into uh, the digital autopilot utilization and development of procedures and, actual, and the capability. Apollo 9 was a, uh, an Earth orbital checkout of the entire Apollo configuration, all the spacecraft, all the computers, and it was a 10-day flight. First five days were just jam-packed with operational activities, and we did such things as uh, the lifeboat exercise with the lunar module, which was subsequently used on Apollo 13. It was a demonstration of uh, having the lunar module, which was a lander, and the command and service module, which was the orbital vehicle, together and utilize the engine on the lander to actually get back from the moon, which Apollo 13 had to do. And the program was written prior to Apollo 9, and we demonstrated it in flight. And it was an interesting exercise. I, I was the command module pilot, or I, I was in a spacecraft that kept one person while the other two guys would go down to the moon, where it all, although on Apollo 9 we didn't go to the moon, but the exercises were carried out. And as uh, my cohorts, uh, Jim McDivitt and Rusty Schweikert, perform the exercise in a lunar module of lighting the engine, why I figured out a little program in a command module with the help of my MIT buddies to monitor their burn in a reverse direction so that I could tell with my computer how their burn was going. Of course, I had the, the platform and the accelerometers and everything, but it was just a matter of reversing a couple of signs. And I could tell them, as a matter of fact, had they lost their uh, limb guidance computer, I could have given them the cutoff instructions and everything else on board. It's not a big thing, but for a user, it's a big thing to be able to have flexibility to do something like that, because nobody had ever planned that, and I found that alone in the command module, it was nice to have something to do. <laughs> but in this, this particular flight, another thing we did was to uh, burn the big engine on the service module, which is a large rocket engine in the combination, to actually light it and guide it through a manually controlled trajectory change. And by that, I mean that we would actually, we actually programmed the computer to give us the parameters in a display format such that during a period of fixed time with the engine on, we would steer, if you would, the, uh, the vehicle by hand. And I actually, and this, this is one of the fun things I got to do on the flight, I actually got to hold a hand controller and with the needles uh, on the display panel, being driven by the computer, fly the spaceship in space with the engine running for, gee, I don't know, it must have been something like three or four minutes, which is a long time. And uh, that's a pretty exciting thing, all through a digital autopilot. Uh, you know, one of the early, you might call, fly-by-wire. Airplanes do it now all the time. But uh, that was, a, I think, a pretty uh, important demonstration of a new capability. Matter of fact, I remember when we were having a meeting in Houston one time, and, a, and all the people from uh, the instrumentation lab came and presented for the first time the idea of a digital autopilot. Everybody said, oh, you, you can't build a digital autopilot. Come on, why don't you guys quit wasting time? Go back to MIT and think. But by golly, it worked. And uh, gosh, now everybody has digital autopilots. A another thing we developed in those days was a rendezvous capability. When I was going to school here, why? The question, and this was in 61, 62, there was a question about could we rendezvous or not in space? Is it even possible? Can you develop the mathematics to bring two vehicles together at a pre precise point in space and time? Uh, a lot of people did a lot of work. Slowly that evolved to the fact that we could do it, and not only that, we put it in the computers and the spacecraft, and on Apollo 9, we did the first Apollo rendezvous, wherein the Rusty and Jim got in the lunar module and separated from myself in the command module and went out about 60 miles and then came back in a rendezvous. 
Well, today, after all the Apollo work and everything, nobody thinks that's a big deal because we've done it so much. But I'll guarantee you, at that time, it was very interesting because they didn't have a heat shield. And had they not returned in a rendezvous, there was no way home. Well, there was a way home, but it wasn't a very good way. <laughs> you know, they could come down. But uh, e even that little exercise was exciting. They had a... We didn't have everything we wanted in the Apollo days. Pe people used to think we did. But, uh, for instance, the uh, command and service module, where I was, did not have a radar. There, there was no way you could actually measure range or range rate. And that's essential... Well, we used to think it was essential for a rendezvous. The lunar module had the radar. The command module did, however, have a computational capability to perform the rendezvous, but without what we thought at the time was adequate information. In other words, we believed at the time that without range information, direct measured range information, the computation wouldn't really converge. And uh, so we still had a program on board. I'll tell you a little bit about the other part of that. but. Rusty and Jim separated, went out, and part of their rendezvous was at night. And lo and behold, the light on the limb, which I was supposed to watch through the sextant to monitor them, failed. And uh, they went into the dark side, and that's the last I saw of them for about 20 minutes. And uh, that gets to be rather exciting. <laughs> Especially when, you know, you're never really sure uh, that the engine burned right, that the attitude was right, that it burned long enough, and all those sorts of things. And I remember, boy, it was really an exciting thing when they came into sunlight and I had them right dead center in a sextant automatically. And it was a combination of the two computers in which the computer on a lunar module calculated the burn, uh, read out the residuals, and Rusty and Jim read the residuals to me, and I entered the burn parameters into my computer, and I told my computer to point to sextant where they, would come, where they would be when they came into sunlight. And it, all of that got done absolutely perfectly. I mean, boy, it was an amazing thing that they popped into sunlight and they were right dead center where they were supposed to be. After all the uncertainties of attitude control and main engine burns and drift and all that sort of thing, pretty, pretty amazing operation. Uh, another thing we had in that flight, which really wasn't associated with a computer that only went on one flight that I know of, was a a little device we call a diastimeter, a diameter measuring optical device uh, through which you would look and, and specific increments of time you would measure the size of the object and you could calculate range. The golfers use that to see how far the pin is. Some of them do. And uh, I carried that on Apollo 9, which was rather interesting. A lot of people used to call it the disaster meter. But uh, I was able to put, I would have been able to put range in and uh, actually get some directly measured information. Uh, but a lot of that ultimately uh, evolved into an optical type rendezvous. And to take the story on through evolution, our, our worries in the early days about not having directly measured radar sort of disappeared. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I then got to fly Apollo 15, and to, to stay on the rendezvous subject, we did it so many times that at the end of the program, my last flight, you could actually uh, use your watch and a rate of angle change and a piece of paper and do a rendezvous. I mean, it, it becomes, after you repeat it so many times, so straightforward as long as you don't have too many uncertainties or a failure of some sort. And, it, you know... I, and it took me back to the days in the early 60s when people said, can we do one? And then, you know, 12 years later, sure, you can do it in the back of the envelope, which is, that's pretty good progress. Uh, I think all of that, though, was because we had a good computational capability in between, which developed the techniques. All the manual techniques really evolved from the computational capability of the computer. We followed the computer, and by doing that, we learned what the computer already knew and the trajectory analysis. Uh, in a physical sense. So it was, it was quite a lesson. I think uh, another thing that happened in those days, back in the Apollo 9 days, as I remember, was a, uh, an event up here called Black Friday, when uh, everybody converged upon the instrumentation lab and started taking programs out of the computer because there just wasn't enough memory. There wasn't enough room. And uh, they took out some programs who were absolutely not supposed to be violated. Return to Earth programs from the moon and everything. Uh, 
<laughs> but, you know, lo and, lo and behold, the judgments were right, and uh, people would work around it, and we'd figure out some other way to do it. Uh, but at the time, some of these, in, in the historical evolution of the, the ultimate capability, sometimes you just don't think you're going to get there. I mean, well, I can remember times we thought a computer won't work, not enough memory, memory cycle time isn't fast enough, can't do this, can't do that, and doom and gloom, and all of it worked out so well, it's just uh, almost unbelievable that we were able to do what we, we did with that old stuff. I mean, I can see it today. I mean, you know, DEC could build a great computer, and we could go to the moon real easy. But when you look at the old things that we were dealing with, uh, quite an accomplishment. I think after I got through with Apollo 9, I went on and, and uh, spent some time as a backup crew member on Apollo 12, and then I got into Apollo 15, which was a, the uh, fourth lunar landing in uh, 1971. And uh, by that time, the capability had really uh, matured. Uh, people understood it. Uh, we were able to do a lot more uh, than even conceived in the beginning. Uh, the lunar landing itself could have been done automatically, and a lot of times people have asked me about that. Uh, it could have been accomplished automatically through the LIM guidance computer, but nobody ever did it. Uh, we all felt, and I was one of them, that you just, when you get to that point and you're going to land on the moon, you've got to have your hands on a stick. <laughs> you just, <laughs> I mean, I like computers, I believe in computers, but it ain't going to land me on the moon. I'm going to do that because, you know, if something gets screwed up, it's going to be me. It ain't going to be the computer. But, but actually, I, my, my thinking was at the time, to be honest about it, was that if a problem did occur, it was so time critical that you wouldn't have time to take corrective action. So you stay ahead of that problem by flying it manually. Now, you're probably fooling yourself because you're still going through the computer. I mean, the stick that you move goes through the computer to fire the thrusters, which is not a lot different from the computer doing it itself, but you feel different, you know? You, I got it, you know? Matter of fact, it, it sort of takes me back to one of our events on Gemini 8. Neil and I got in this tumble up there. We had a, a thruster stuck on, and in the Gemini spacecraft, you had only one hand controller. It was in the center console between the two crew members, and the guy on the left would fly it with his right hand, and the guy on the right would fly in his left hand. Same, same hand controller. And we got in this spin up there, this tumble, and Neely was a boss, and he was trying to get everything situated and organized and get us stopped, and he had tried everything. And we'd been talking back and forth and try this and try that, every switch we could think of, every combination we could think of. And in a period of frustration like that, you, di you dig really, really deep into try something else. So Neil's doing all this with a stick, and he looks over at me and says, you try it. And I grabbed it, and I went like this. I said, I can't stop it either. Well, it's only one stick. <laughs> yeah. And it ain't going to make any difference who's hanging on to it. <laughs> but you get in a situation, and, and we both agreed at the time that it would be better for somebody else to hold on to the stick. <laughs> you know? and, you know, I, and we didn't figure that one out for about three months. <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, back, back to 15, the... the uh, the, the LIM guidance computer had the capability to, to automatically land on the moon, which says that, you know, we could send a tremendous payload up there if you could get rid of the guys and send it automatically. But once it got there, what would it do? Uh, but it had, it, as we did our landing and as this system evolved, we got more and more capability. We had a little switch that we put in. And instead of trying to descend to the lunar surface by some visual display and a coordination of a, a throttle, we put a switch in a computer, and every time you flick the, sw the switch, it was spring-loaded, you get one foot per second change, which was a, a really nice way to land. And you're coming down at 10, you go click, 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 click. You're coming down at 7, 6, 5, and you would probably hear on the ground here on Earth the, uh, the lunar module pilot, the guy on the right side, calling out these uh, descent rates, altitude and altitude rate. And it sounded like the guy flying it was really precise with that throttle. Well. <laughs> He was. He had a computer there doing it for him. So you'd hear this neat, crisp 10 feet per second, 8 feet per second, you know, really smooth, click, click, click. And you think, well, that guy's really, really flying it. Well, he just hit a switch there. <laughs> you know, computer doing the whole thing. But uh, we, we also had some of these human factors considerations in the, 
the computer and the whole spaceship. And I remember one that got a lot of attention up here, uh, a lot of attention in Houston too, was how to simplify the command of the, the computer to do the next step. And we had finally, we developed a button called the Proceed button, Pro. And uh, I think probably everybody takes that for granted now, but boy, if you could go through the iterations that we went through to get this Proceed button, which was a one button push to have something happen. And a lot of people were afraid of having uh, no confirmation button, push proceed and things happen, but we worked through that. Although I remember everybody in the lunar module during a landing had to think very carefully about which buttons they pushed because there were three buttons that you could push and had to push, as a matter of fact, in sequence. Uh, there was a proceed button in the computer. There was an engine shutdown button, which turned off the engine, and there was a, an abort button which separated the ascent stage from the descent stage and aborted you. And all three buttons were in the same proximity. <laughs> and you know, one of them was a black background with a little pro written on it. Another one was blue and the other one was red. But they were all sort of the same size. And you really had to think about that coming down to the landing. Because when you got down, you had to hit the proceed button to put the computer to sleep for a while. Uh, when, when the uh, probes on the bottom of the landing gear touched the lunar surface, you got a signal on a cockpit, and they were about, I don't know, 12 feet, 10 feet from the ground, and you had to shut the engine down then, because on our flight in particular, we had an extend, extended engine bell, and if you settled on the lunar surface with the rocket engine running, you'd blow the bell out because of the compression. So as soon as you had the signal, you had to push the button to shut the engine down. But you didn't want to push the abort button, because then you would never land. So it was a... <laughs> Really tricky situation, and the human factors things came in, but as I look back on it, I say, you know, it's probably, we probably got away with one there, you know, because nobody ever hit the wrong buttons that I know of. <laughs> anyway, I, I think that maybe is sort of a background. Uh, perhaps I could answer questions if anybody has any questions relating to the, the user's approach to this sort of device. I think... Uh, Maybe in summary, the, the, uh, the, the uh, Apollo guidance computer, lunar module guidance computer, we had a lot of names for the device. It was the same basic machine. It was really a, a terrific system. Uh, it had a lot of capability, a lot of user input, and uh, I don't know what the, the, the people who actually built the computers thought about we users, but uh, we thought it was pretty remarkable that all this could be done. We kept coming up. I keep thinking these stories. We keep on, on a one thing that I thought was terrific on Apollo 9. About two weeks before flight, uh, we had this big rack of four cameras that we wanted to point directly to the Earth and take pictures. First real IR pictures that anybody took. Different film in each of the four cameras. So you had to point directly at the Earth, and you had as you were going over the Earth, you had to track the vertical very precisely. In the simulators, we found out we could do hmm, fair but not really as, as good as the principal investigator wanted. And as I remember, something like two weeks before flight, we called up the folks up here, and I forget who it was, but I, I remember working with a guy, said, hey, can we do a little orb rate with a computer driving a spacecraft? He said, of course. Which way do you want to go and how fast? And in a matter of, I think, a couple of days, we had a program in a simulator that automatically drove the spacecraft at orbit rate, perfect orb rate, and we got into flight with very little chance to practice or verify it and put it on the cameras, and it was remarkable. It was perfect. You, you could not manually fly it that well, and it uh, did a good job getting pictures. Does anybody have any questions that I might answer? Right in the front. The question was, what sort of commands or f could we issue and what sort of functions? Well. The language that was developed for the user was a verb-noun language, and, and two digits would be a verb, uh, for instance, display the coordinates of, and two more digits would be a noun, uh, velocity. So you'd say verb 26, noun 34, and you get a display of three components of velocity. Or you could say uh, position the spacecraft at some orientation or attitude, and you'd load that in, you, you do a verb, then do a noun, load your coordinates or your position, your attitude, 
push proceed, and it would automatically move the spacecraft to that orientation. So it was a combination of verbs and nouns. We could display, we could maneuver, uh, we could turn the engine on and off, uh, we could navigate. Uh, anything, gee, I'd have to go back and look at the list, but I th think at the end we were using something like, what, 50 or 60 verbs? Yeah, pretty close to maximum. And uh, I'm sure we could have, each flight people thought of more things to do.